Got your full five quota done. It's important to finish what we start. Hey, um, great to have you here today. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Ben, and uh, it's a privilege to be sharing God's word with you today. Uh, anybody excited about the cricket final on tonight? There's about three of you. Awesome. Uh, look, uh, Joseph, wherever you are, I know that you're proudly supporting India. I'm sorry for your loss in advance. In faith, the Australians are bringing the World Cup home. Majority of you have no idea or don't care. Uh, shame on you. Shame on you. There's literally no sport on this weekend except for that game. So get on to it. Jump on. Stay up late. No, that's not real sport. Cool. Hey, are you all doing good today? Yeah. Are you doing good today? Yeah. Come on, responsiveness helps me. Are you doing good today? Yeah. There we go. Come on, that's good. Well, if you're taking notes today, obviously it is Legacy Sunday, but my sermon title simply is Faith, Sacrifice, and Legacy. Faith, sacrifice, and legacy. A legacy is something that lives on beyond us when we're gone. It's something that's passed on to the next generation that continues after we might have passed away and gone to be with Jesus, or maybe when we've left an organization and gone on to somewhere else. But if it's a legacy, it continues on beyond us. There are lots of different types of legacies. There's financial legacies, leaving a, a financial inheritance for your children. That's a legacy where you give something for the next generation that you yourself don't enjoy, but you pass it on to the next. There are impact legacies where our life makes an impact in somebody and then they take what we impacted them with and it carries on. It might be an act of kindness that blesses someone so much that it transforms them and they believe, I, I need to be a person of kindness as well. Your character being displayed daily to your children, those are impact legacies and our kids carry those on. We have also organizational legacies where maybe we build an organization or our organization does something so significant that we talk about it for years to come. A medical breakthrough or a scientific innovation, these things that are so big that they go on and they make a massive difference for generations. These are all amazing legacies, but today we're really speaking about kingdom legacies. Things of the kingdom of God that we can do to live on beyond us for the next generation. These are the things that we can do for Jesus that impact not just the people around us, but potentially your grandchildren, their children, and their children, and that we can do something significant. A, a, a kingdom of God legacy could be the fact that you're the first person in your family to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's a legacy moment. You're making a decision, you're drawing a line in the sand, and you say, hey, from this moment on, my family line, we're following Jesus. And you make that decision. And what was once in the past has now been transformed for what is coming in the future. The way we live our life, the things that we do, the things we stand for, they have the potential to leave a kingdom legacy. But today I want to speak into this whole notion of, of giving a li living a life of sacrifice and how that then leads to the legacy. But a kingdom legacy requires both faith and sacrifice to be realized. You see, a kingdom legacy isn't established in one moment, but it's established through faith and sacrifice. And I, I think there's this amazing story in Scripture that I want to point us to in the writings of Mark, which talk about this wonderful woman, the legacy that was left because of her act of faith and her act of sacrifice. And if you've got a Bible, you can follow along in cha uh, Mark chapter 14. If you don't, it's going to be on the screen. But it says, talking about Jesus, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Verse 6, leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It's a powerful story. I'm going to unpack it today and look at this whole notion of faith, sacrifice, and legacy. Jesus is just at dinner with his friends. Just a normal everyday dinner. 
Imagine yourself, you're out at a restaurant and you're dining with your friends and just minding your own business. And to our modern mind and to our modern understanding, it seems pretty unusual that a woman would just simply come up and she would anoint Jesus with oil or perfume. Like, imagine yourself just sitting down in a restaurant and somebody comes and sprays you with deodorant. It's a little bit of a weird moment. I, I was thinking this week, like we've got year 12 graduations going on everywhere. Parents are proud. They're posting all of these photos of, of high school students running down the, this like tunnel of honor and getting their award and saying, well done to their kids. But see, one of my memories of, of high school that I will never escape was the smell of the men's locker room. Like it was terrible, the odor in that place. After lunch, it was the worst. You'd go in and it just stank. And what would happen inevitably every day after lunch is that the smell would get terrible. And then all of a sudden, boys would go into their locker and they would pull out a can of Lynx Africa. And they would just start spraying all over, zigzags across their shirts, trying to douse themselves with a nice smelling cologne to get rid of the smell. That's kind of how you might read this story. Jesus is at his the table with friends and, and all of a sudden it's like this woman comes up and starts spraying perfume. But it's not that at all. There's actually a lot of significance into it. You see, I was a primary school teacher for many years and year six boys, I tell you what, they don't realize they're starting to smell. Like, I mean, there's, it's bad when someone smells, but it's even worse when they don't realize it, when they're oblivious to it. And they walk in and they're like flirting with a girl and they're wondering why the girl is re recoiling from them. <laughs> what we would do is we would, we would go and say, hey, okay, boys, it's lunchtime. Everyone line up, arms up. And they'll walk in, spray, spray, spray. Every one of them would get a spray <laughs> because of the stink. But that's not what's happening with Jesus. That's not what's going on. But maybe he did smell. I don't know, but that is not what's going on here. You see, anointing somebody at dinner was actually common hospitality. It was actually something that was done as a sign of respect and honor to your guests. Not everybody did it, especially if you couldn't afford it, but it was a sign of dignity, a sign of honor, a sign of respect that the host would actually come and they would anoint you with perfume or oil. That wasn't unusual in this story. What was unusual though is how expensive the perfume was that was used. This is not Lynx Africa. This is not Lynx Java, whatever your favorite brand. This was an expensive perfume. And it is not something that you can probably buy on any of our wages. And it leads me to this thought, that sacrifice is costly. Sacrifice is costly. Like an offering doesn't need to be costly. It can just be a little bit over and above. That's not costly, but sacrifice is costly. It'll cost you something. You see, when you hear the word sacrifice, many of us have got different things that we think of instantly. Maybe you think of the, the medieval movies you watched as a kid and you saw these terrible sacrifices going on. Maybe you grew up reading the Old Testament and you can imagine what the old religious traditions were of sacrificing lamb after lamb after lamb to take away people's sins. Maybe you think of that. Maybe though for you, you think of sacrifice and you think of a single parent raising their children, sacrificing their own aspirations and dreams so that they can provide for their kids and give them a good education. That's, that's a sacrifice. Whatever you think of in regards to sacrifice, you might have a different picture, but I believe we can agree this, that it is costly. A sacrifice isn't just a pat on the back. It's not just one day of waking up early to get someone off to school. It's a sacrifice. It costs you. And in the instance of this woman, it was 100% costly. The lady pours out expensive perfume. How expensive? Well, Mark 14 verse 5 says it could have been sold for more than a year's wages. Now, that sounds expensive, but that's just a modern translation so that it makes sense to us. If you go back to the original, it actually says that it was 300 denarii. Now, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we have to actually look at what does that mean in consideration to value. Well, in Mark chapter 6, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, we read the feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 men, that is. 5,000 men. And the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, send these guys off to get something to eat. And they're like, no, 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 you give them something to eat. And one of the disciples pipes up and says, no, 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 master, that would cost more than a year's wages. 
So we're thinking, okay, feeding 5,000 5, men more than a year's wages. But the translation for that is not 300 denarii. Feeding 5,000 men would have cost 200 denarii. So 5,000 men at an all-you-can-eat buffet was cheaper than the perfume that was poured out on Jesus' head at this dinner. That's a costly sacrifice. I mean, if you think about what it costs to feed the people at your wedding. I mean, people spend an exorbitant amount of money on weddings these days. I tell you what, eloping looks more and more uh, popular, I think, in my opinion, especially because I've got three daughters. Pray for me. But... It's expensive to feed 5,000 men. I can't imagine how much that would cost. But it was more expensive, this jar of perfume that she poured out on Jesus' head. Now, when we read about this, we find out that it's an expensive perfume imported from India. All the Indians, give me a bit of a nod. Come on, VJ, do it for me. Most Aussie-sounding Indian I've ever met, VJ. You're a good man. By the way, if you've, has anybody ever seen um, uh, Madagascar 2? Yeah. There's a character named Modo Modo. And he walks like this, like he struts. Oh, it's VJ, like 100%. <laughs> Watch him walk today. Got nothing to do with my sermon, but like every time he walks, it's like his chest is popping. It's like, chunky and chunky. <laughs> I can't even do it. Sorry, VJ. I'm completely off topic. I love you. And you've got the best strut I've ever seen. All right, let's get back to it. This perfume imported from India, it's expensive, more than a year's wages. The, it was sealed in an alabaster jar, which by itself was a really expensive container. It's not just like this cheap container with a cork on top. It's sealed. It's 100% sealed. The only way to get it open is to break it. And once it's broken, it has to be used because it can't be sold again. The longer it's sealed, the more expensive it's get. It's like a bottle of wine that gets more valuable the longer it ages. So this woman gives this massive sacrifice, currently worth 300 denarii. If she'd kept on to it, it would have been worth more and more the longer she held on to it. Most scholars believe it was a family heirloom passed on to her, most likely for the dowry for her future wedding. Are we starting to picture just how costly this sacrifice, this gift that this woman gave to Jesus was? This wasn't just a little bit of deodorant. This was literally laying down her hopes for her future for Jesus in that moment. This is her saying, I don't know if I'm going to get married and it doesn't even matter. I want to give this expensive gift to my Savior, Jesus. That's a lot of faith. That's a woman saying, hey, I'm actually entrusting my future to you, Jesus. I'm giving my everything to you. This was an expensive sacrifice. Why would she do that? Well, you would never do that to someone you don't believe in. You would never do that to someone that you don't actually think is the Messiah. She believed that Jesus was the Messiah. She believed in serving him. She believed in his ministry and she had great belief, but her faith wasn't belief alone. It was accompanied by action. It's so easy to believe in theory. But believing in action is another thing. This woman said, I love you and I believe in you so much that I am willing to lay down this significant sacrifice. Why? Why was she willing to make such a sacrifice? Well, my next thought is that extravagant sacrifice flows from extravagant gratitude. You don't give in that way without first having your heart moved. You don't give in that way just because it was a, a nice meal and you wanted to say thank you to the host. This is a significant, extravagant sacrifice moved by extravagant gratitude. You see, the woman that is mentioned in this scripture is not named by Mark, but she's not nameless. She's got a story. She's got a background. And in fact, you can read about her story in two of the other gospels. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 to 13, and in John chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. And we discover that this nameless woman has a name, and her name is Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus. For those of you who don't necessarily know what I'm talking about, Lazarus previously was dead. And Jesus comes along four days after he's been dead and buried in the grave. And he calls to him, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man bound in grave cloths comes out of the grave alive and well. This is the Mary we're talking about. 
she has seen Jesus do significant things. She has seen Jesus do something in her life that nobody else has seen. She is willing to give an extravagant sacrifice because Jesus had done extravagant things in your life. A year's wages might seem like a lot of money, but it's not much in comparison to seeing your brother brought back to life. You see, a sacrifice will cost us and it will be a hard to give if we don't have a heart of gratitude. You see, you can give sacrificially and you can do it looking like this. There you go, Jesus. Take it all. Or you can do it with a smile on your face. Jesus, thank you so much for what you've done. I'm giving this to you. The extravagant gift came from extravagant gratitude because of all that Jesus had done for her. Her brother was dead and now is alive. She saw him do it. And she's got faith in him and what he will do in the future. When we find ourselves finding it difficult to be generous or being, finding it difficult to sacrifice for something bigger than ourselves, we've got to come back and say, am I actually grateful for what God has done? Or have I grown used to it and just expect it to happen now? You see, what we can do in our society is we can say, start to say, I believe I deserve God's blessing. I'm a good person. I'm better than the person down the road. I'm better than my neighbor. That's annoying. And we start to believe we deserve things instead of having gratitude and believing that every good thing comes from God and is not deserved by me. When we have gratitude, we come to God with thankfulness. And our sacrifice is done with a smile on our face. Psalm 107 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 100 verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Have you got something to be thankful for today, church? Yes. I didn't hear you. Have you got something to be thankful for? Yes. Did you go to the Robbie Williams concert yesterday? You've got something to be thankful for. Who knows what it is? It might be small. It might seem insignificant, but we have got something to be thankful for and to give God praise for. If you can't think about anything in your week, start to think about your eternity. Start to think about the fact that God saved you. He took away your sin. He made your slate clean. He took all of our past and he made us brand new. He even took your future sin away so that you could have a hope that is sure and secure. Thankfulness and gratitude is what delights God. Sacrifice isn't necessarily. You see, sacrifice itself is not the goal. We can do that with a poor attitude without realizing all that God has done. But thankfulness and gratitude, that's something we can cultivate in our heart. And the simple overflow then is that we are willing to give God anything he asks because we realize he's already given us more than we ever deserve. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. You'll know, well, if you've grown up in church, you'll know this. It's one of my favorites. That each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, we will abound in every good work. What has God done in your life that we can be grateful for? Well, you've got breath in your lungs. You got a roof over your head. You got food in your fridge. If you've got electricity bills, well, you've got electricity. And so that's something to be thankful for. We've got something to be grateful for and to give a sacrifice which flows from gratitude. I have received so much from God. And I want others to have the same opportunity that I have had because of what God has done in my life. But extravagant sacrifice will face opposition. There is opposition to our sacrifice. It didn't take long for Mary to have given this beautiful gift for the haters to start yelling at her, to start calling out, oh, you could have used your money better than that. That was a waste of money. That was more than a year's worth of salary. That could have actually gone to feed the homeless people. We read later in, in one of the other accounts of this same story is that it wasn't just any disciples. It was actually Judas that was making these accusations. Judas that would later betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Money had a hold of Judas's heart. And when he saw it spent on something he didn't value, he started to throw dirt at Mary. But Mary was true to what she had felt in her heart. 
and a love that Jesus defends her despite others' rebukes. Should we be wise with our sacrifice? A hundred percent. We need to be wise. We need to pray. We need to have good diligence in what we give. But we shouldn't use wisdom as an excuse to guard our lack of generosity either. When God speaks, we can trust that he'll provide and he is worthy of our gratitude. One of the greatest oppositions we face is not from other people and not from people saying you shouldn't do that, but it's actually from our own doubts, our own sense of fear, our lack of control. You see, when you give beyond yourself, whether it's financially or, or in time or energy, whatever it might be, what we can start to think is, oh, I don't have control anymore. And we grasp to get it back. Oh, but if I give that, I'm not going to have control of the things I do. I won't have control if this unexpected bill comes in. And we can start to wander away, wander away from the act of generosity and sacrifice. We will face questions, so we should be wise. But we can trust that God is good and he will provide for us. Mary gave willingly, cheerfully, sacrificially, but it wasn't because there was just a great moment that presented herself to do it. It was because Mary had already learned to sacrifice something much greater than her expensive perfume. Mary had learned that the most expensive sacrifice that you can pay is not financial. It is not giving an asset away, but it's actually laying her life down for the sake of God. She heard Jesus teaching in Luke chapter 9, 23. He said, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Mary had been following Jesus and heard him teach. And he, she wasn't just doing this for the first time. She'd already given her life to him. She'd already given her future to him. And so this expensive offering was just an overflow of what she had already given. Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Jesus calls us to daily give up our life for the purposes of God. That's the sacrifice that Jesus is ultimately after, is that we would surrender ourselves to following Jesus every day of the week. And as we do that, it's not that hard to then, if he says, hey, would you actually surrender that finance? Or would you give some time to go and reach out to that person? Because you've already said yes, and you've already practiced it by laying down your life for Jesus. And it's not like Jesus asked us to do something he wasn't willing to do himself. Jesus took up his cross so that I didn't have to die myself. He paid the ultimate sacrifice so that I can choose to lay down my life for him. We follow in his example. If I can have the keys, please. Final thought is that extravagant sacrifice leaves a legacy. Naturally, leaving a financial legacy for your children, it requires sacrifice. It means not necessarily spending all of your money in retirement, going on a few less cruises, you know what I mean. Anybody enjoying a few cruises? I've got nothing against cruises. I would love to go on one. Uh, but it's saying, hey, I'm going to make sure that I'm passing something on to the next generation. Working hard, not just for me, but also for my children to come. Buying a home is a, requires sacrifice. I, I don't buy everything I want every day so that I can buy something more significant and have something to pass on to my kids. Leaving a legacy requires sacrifice. But it's our prayer that every dollar that we give today would actually result in something bigger than just a, a nice number that we can celebrate, but that every dollar given would leave a legacy. And ultimately that legacy is people discovering Jesus, discovering his love, discovering his hope for them, discovering that he is the way, he is the truth and he is the light. That's our hope. Not that we would be able to celebrate, yeah, we hit our goal. But that we could see more people every week encountering Jesus in all different spaces because we were willing to sacrifice for something bigger than ourselves. I mentioned before that this property, this church, 
is a result of the sacrifice of many people before us. We are living in their legacy. 1951, Glad Tidings Tabernacle bought a parcel of land in Belmont. This once was Belmont. There were no roads. There was no infrastructure. And in 1951, they built the small hall at the front of our property. It was mission brown color, oil. And they had about 30 people that would gather for Sunday school, for youth outreach, and for Sunday services. And they would send Bible college students out to practice preaching. We have photos in our history books of people arriving on a horse and cart, tethering their horse tied to a tree, 1951. But it actually started before then with Ralph Reed, famous pastor in the AOG, doing a tent mission in Belmont, planting a seed that one day there would be a church. This is that church. Pastor Ralph Reed went to be with the Lord recently. He's not here and he's not living in this legacy, but he sowed a seed. He sacrificed. Glad Tidings Tabernacle, but now called Hope Centre, bought this land and we don't have any debt on the land because generations ago, people sowed a sacrifice. 20 years ago, Pastor Chris and Beverly had a dream that the small auditorium that would fit 120 people crammed in wasn't big enough for what God wanted to do. And for 20 years, they sacrificed and they sowed and they invested. And in 2016, this church was built. $1.5 million in the bank at the time, $2 million mortgage at the time, but they sacrificed. You'll never know the sacrifices of every person that sowed into those things. Many of those people have gone to be with the Lord. But we stand upon their shoulders. Now with the decision, will we enjoy the comforts of what they gave us? Or will we continue to believe that the legacy has only just begun? And that we will do something significant. And it may not be significant today, but day by day by day, lay my life down for the cause of Jesus saying yes to him every single day, that I can continue to build something upon the shoulders of the men and women that have gone before me, and that we will see something in another 70 years time that I'm not around to see, but my grandchildren will be living in. Living a life of legacy requires sacrifice. This year, as we give to Priceless House, I'm not gonna meet the women that we support or the children that are born, but we're sowing a seed believing that every life matters. And they have the right to encounter Jesus for themselves and to live a good life. I'm not gonna meet the young men and women that Teen Challenge help bring out of drug and alcohol addiction. I'm not gonna meet the parents that are celebrating on the day where they're celebrating their year anniversary of being free. I'm not gonna see that but I'm choosing to sow into that. We are choosing to sow into that. I'm not gonna meet every child that receives an education in the Philippines, but I'm believing that lives will be educated and that they will change the direction of their family because they will have a better start than what their parents had and be able to move forward. I may not meet all the people that are ministered to in the Correctional Institute for Women, but I'm believing that they'll encounter Jesus and when they're set free from prison, they're already free from the chains of sin. We're believing that Water for Africa will see people's natural needs met so that they can have a spiritual encounter with God. We're believing that Favour Church Korea will reach a generation for Jesus that we won't simply talk about Yongi Cho generations ago in a move of God, but there will be a move of God in this generation and that the young adults and the youth will come back to Jesus and that South Korea will once again be a nation that glorifies God. I'm believing that our high school and our youth ministries, our, our university ministries are going to see people encounter Jesus. I'm believing as we upgrade our facilities and one day purchase next door, that we are gonna see more people here than we ever dreamed was possible. 
not because it makes us look good, but because there are thousands upon thousands of people all around us that need the love of Jesus. This woman had no idea what legacy she was leaving when she made that sacrifice. She had no idea. She didn't know that Jesus was going to say that this was going to be told wherever the gospel is preached. She had no idea. But one act of of generosity, one sacrifice attached to the mission of Jesus, and it's resulted in a story being told thousands of years later, still encouraging me, still encouraging you to daily lay my life down for something greater than myself. She had no idea what her sacrifice meant. And we don't know what our sacrifice means. But one day, maybe somebody will tell a story. I want to tell you about my grandfather, Ben, who left a cushy job, pursued ministry, and laid his life down for the purpose of God. Let me tell you a story about my grandfather, Kem, who before even having kids, made a sacrifice to invest in the next generation, believing that there would be an amazing kids' church program for when they do have kids in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter how big our sacrifice. What matters is how big our heart is and how willing we are. God doesn't love big sacrifice. He loves big faith. I'm going to finish with this. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus is literally sitting down watching the offering be collected. Kind of to like today. People are coming in with bags of coins and they're just like, there you go. VJ Strut. <laughs> and Jesus calls his disciples over. I mean, imagine this happening on a Sunday. He calls his disciples over and Jesus like, sits down. Look at these guys. <laughs> Look at them throw their big bags of coins in like they matter. They're giving out a wealth. It's nothing. See this little widow that's coming down? She's about to throw two copper coins in. Doesn't look like much, but she's giving out of her poverty. She's given much more than the large bags of coins, not by value in dollars, but by value of sacrifice, by faith. When you give when you don't have much, that's true faith. That's me saying, Jesus, I trust you. I don't know if I'm going to have enough to make ends meet, but I'm trusting you. I can't help but give, God, because you're so good to me. And so Jesus watches and he points it out, makes a teaching moment of it. It's a beautiful thing because Jesus doesn't look at the size of what is put in, but it's about the heart and have we surrendered fully to him. Mary's sacrifice is linked to the cross. Jesus says in verse 8, She did what she could. She poured out perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. No idea that the oil that she was given was going to be linked to the cross, and yet her story was told. We won't realize the significance of our sacrifice potentially in this life. But without the sacrifice today, a story isn't going to be told in years to come. If Mary didn't make the sacrifice, be one less story in the Bible, one less thing that points people to Jesus. Let's live a life that everything points people to Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to pray. Before we do, the greatest sacrifice ever paid, I've mentioned it before, was not one that paid for a building or one that set up a generational wealth for people to come, but it was the sacrifice of Jesus. He paid a price that none of us could pay. And talk about a heart that was surrendered. His heart was surrendered fully, even unto death. The Bible tells me that I have sinned. I've made mistakes that don't glorify God. They fall short of his standard. And unfortunately, the punishment and penalty for my sin is actually eternal separation from God. Where I can't be forgiven and I can't enter into his presence and I can't receive eternal life. That's a big price to pay for sin. But Jesus loved me and he loves you so much that he didn't want us to pay the price for that sin. And so he decided he was going to pay it. Even though he didn't deserve it, 
even though he didn't need to pay it, he chose to do it because he wanted to sacrifice himself so that we could receive the legacy of faith in Jesus. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 23, that while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And Romans 10, 9 says, all we have to do to receive that gift is believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and declare that He is alive. He's not dead. And we receive Him into our life. We begin a relationship with Jesus today and forevermore. Our sins are taken away. The price has been paid for. The sacrifice was made so that it didn't have to be made again. Jesus paid the price for me and he paid the price for you. And to receive it, it's pretty simple. All you got to do is say, yes, please, Jesus. I want some of that. Can I have that gift? It's already been paid for. It's no strings attached. It's just a gift that he wants to give you because he loves you enough to take away your sins by dying on the cross. So I'm going to ask if you would close your eyes for a moment and have a moment with God. And today, if you haven't asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and asked Him to be your Lord and Savior, we're going to have a moment where you can do that. It's one moment, but it leads to an eternal moment where you're forever in His presence where you'll never be alone, where you'll be with Him for all of eternity. So today, if you haven't made that decision before, saying, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me. Or if maybe you made the decision once ago, but you haven't made that decision and you, uh, for a long time because you walked away from God, then today you can do it. There is no judgment. There's only acceptance and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. So with every head bowed, every eye closed today if you'd like to say yes to receiving that gift from God on the count of three I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so that you can acknowledge that you'd like to receive that gift from Jesus one two three raise your hand that's awesome I see that hand that's great I see that hand as well is there anyone else that today says hey I I want to make that decision amazing we're going to pray this prayer today and I'm going to ask you to pray it with me we'll all pray it with you because we believe in celebrating with you It's a simple prayer of just asking Jesus to forgive us. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it with me. Say, dear Jesus, I confess that I have sinned. I've fallen short of your standards. And I need your forgiveness. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. To forgive me for my sins. I give you my life. I believe you died on the cross for me. But you're now alive. And today I am choosing to become a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, would you celebrate with those that made that decision today? No greater decision than saying yes to Jesus. And today, if you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't raise it, but you wanted to, then afterwards we would love to have a talk with you in the info area and VIP space. And And one of our team will hopefully have seen your hand and they'd love to just have a conversation about that. We'd love to give you a gift just to encourage you as you continue.